distinguished background as a research engineer and advisor at Airbus. Did work there. Lux, I think, is a research group. EFJ, a yeah. famous venture fund with partners there that makes out out there on the edge kinds of investments. Then with my former partner Vinod Kosla at Kosla Ventures, and now you formed uh, your own fund together with Steve Jurbetson, I think, called Future Ventures. And all this in the course of a decade or less, right? That's right. Uh, where's the best place of all those to do breakthrough work? Future ventures, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but well, maybe not obvious. Tell us why. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually a fair question. When uh, when Steve and I uh, reconnected about a year ago, um, having worked together at DFJ and, and gone separate ways, um, we really asked ourselves the question of why start another venture fund? Uh, you know, is this an act of hubris? Can we do real good in the world? Uh, in some ways, there's more capital than there is sense in the market right now. So what's the justification for starting yet another early stage venture capital fund? And, and how do we differentiate? Or the Yava, yet another venture. There you go. Uh, Yava, it's good. Uh, and, and for us, after some some real thought and consideration to, to start uh, this venture and to do so mindfully, we decided that where we saw uh, a gap in the market, um, and obviously people like Luke have, are there already, um, but that where we saw a, 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 a space for a few more players is within this translation layer between the most challenging, interesting, off the edge of the map technologies their opportunity to do great good in the world and to ha be the type of investors where we can come in early, help foster those ideas, do so with high conviction, but to do so with entrepreneurs who, who have a plan and who have a vision for really creating positive, impactful change in the world. And to look at those entrepreneurs and say, what does your company look like? Not in three and or five, but in 15, 20, and 50 years. Will your sources of funding, your limited partners, be patient for 15 or 20 years to a return? That, that's where we've been incredibly fortunate. Uh, our, our own limited partners, uh, the people who really believed in our vision, are just a group of the most amazing, phenomenal, brilliant, visionary individuals, family offices that we could hope for. And um, part of the, the course of the fund was saying that we're, we're going to be a bit of a longer term fund than your classic. So we, um, from the beginning, said, you know, fund one is a 15 year endeavor. So if, if you truly understand um, that for the types of companies we invest in, they, they start hitting their stride seven to nine years out from our earliest investment. And so that's when you want to be really kind of pouring in even further commitments and support and not thinking about dialing out of, of your fund and that it might have this 10-year horizon. So venture capitalists are famous for getting along, co-investing oh, yeah. with each other. <laughs> so suppose you and Luke are competing to win the opportunity <laughs> to back an entrepreneur. <laughs> what will you say to contrast your fund with Luke's? Or are they a lot alike? I've got a good right hook now. Um, <laughs> Uh, at the end of the day, I think, I think we have to really look at what, what our type of investing is, which is in investing in for-profit institutions with the intention of you know, taking a large pile of money and turning it into a, a larger one, and uh, in the hope of that, doing that with companies that will, will change the world for the better. But the simple reality is that we're not in the most scalable business. Um, we are individuals. Uh, it's Steve and I in Future Ventures, it's Luke and his partners in GigaFund. And in each of these funds, uh, you have to recognize that it's not just about um, the overall vision, but the actual connection between the people. And so I think for us, it's less about us versus them, because this is not a zero-sum game. And if we're looking at it as a zero-sum game, we're approaching investing from a scarcity <coughs> mindset, and that's absolutely the wrong mindset. Uh, but from an abundance mindset, you say, how are we at our best and highest use for this company? How are our capabilities, um, our adjacent areas of competency, our own networks most useful to the entrepreneur? And how do we get along with them? Because 
the, the right partnerships show up at the right times. And so there, hopefully there's space for many players at the table and often there's a conversation where Luke will go very early and uh, we'll, we'll maybe see the same opportunities and say it's not the, not the right opportunity for us right now, but it might be later and vice versa. Is your fund co-invested with Luke either at the same time or before or after? Uh, we, we have at least two, uh, two investments in common. Out of how many investments? Uh, so Future Ventures started uh, in, in January of 2019, officially investing out of the fund, and we have 10 investments so far. You invest with Luke more frequently than any other firm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Um, that, that might actually really be true. <laughs> We're both so small. It's starting. And we have similar visions. Right. So Mariana, tell us about a venture you're particularly excited about, a new project. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited to share this project. Um, so I, uh, I really, I, I believe that so many of our world's conflicts are, are around uh, this concept of energy scarcity. And uh, we, we recently found a company out of MIT called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, uh, which is a nuclear fusion company, uh, which uh, we have the privilege of co-investing in with, with some amazing uh, other investors like uh, your former colleague and partner, Vinod Kosla. Um, and so Commonwealth Fusion Systems is a nuclear fusion company coming, it's the culmination of uh, 30, 40 years of uh, nuclear physics research out of MIT. It's fusion, not fission. Uh, so we can, we can talk about some of the constraints around that later. But the, the exciting opportunity here is to look at classic nuclear physics, uh, some very, very clever engineering around the magnets, and say that there might be, in, in the near future, in the tractable future for us, a, a way to build nuclear fusion plants <coughs> that are safe, that meet regulatory standards uh, that actually produce uh, more energy out than you put in, uh, and, and to do so in a, in a clean <coughs> manner and hopefully solve a lot of, um, start start kind of moving in the world of, of answering the world energy crisis. So this sounds really attractive. I want to ask you this question. Were you more compelled by the technology and market promise or by the team? Which weighed more in your mind in that case? You know, it is, it's, so for one, like, let's set the ground basis, which is yeah. we fund, we, we participated in the Series A, which was a $100 million Series A. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things are interesting about this company. Um, it's also uh, part of a partnership with the university. Uh, and so what was interesting to us is they... Um, the project or the people? It, it was, it was both. It was the, the brilliance, I know it's a terrible answer, but it was... The, well, I, I can't get you to compare yourself to Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon, I'm going to turn the audience loose. There you go. Um, it, it was it was really what it was was watching uh, this project that we know needs to exist in the world, but the people who decided to join it was the most salient matter. So, really understanding that just world leading experts were leading academic positions, jobs in brilliant companies, uh, just really taking a risk on their lifestyles to join this company. I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. It just sounds like the people. Yeah. 